Uh, this example problem is loosely based on a true story. I do have a friend named Jeffrey who uh, pretty much can't live without his morning coffee. Now, um, I don't know if he's ever been backpacking through Europe or not, but I would imagine if he did, he'd come up with some method so that he could easily make coffee on the go. One way you could do it would be to use something called an immersion heater. Immersion heaters uh, are just like pictured here. They have a standard US plug, and then that just sends current to a piece of metal that's um, a pretty thick piece of metal. And we know that thin pieces of metal have high resistance and thicker ones have lower resistance. And if they have low resistance, then um, if you use 120 volts with a low resistance, power is equal to voltage squared divided by resistance. So there's an inverse proportionality be between resistance and heating power. And this is kind of how a toaster oven works or anything that cooks using electricity. You send electricity through some uh, thick wires and they heat up like crazy. And then if you dunk that, this metal part of it, if you put it into a pot filled with water, then the heat transfers out of the metal into the water. The water eventually boils and then you can pour that boiling water oh, maybe into a travel version of a French press. If anyone's ever made coffee with a French press, you just put boiling water and all your coffee grounds in here, you let them steep for a while, and then you push down on this plunger and it strains the coffee grounds from the water and then you can pour it into your cup and there you go. So um, enough of the background on this one. Let's uh, get into the numerical part of this physics problem. The immersion heater is rated at 600 watts and it's rated based on its use in a standard household outlet. Now the problem is, in a lot of other countries, their standard for electricity is different from the US. Uh, a lot of European countries have a higher voltage at their outlets, and their outlets don't look like ours. So our outlets, uh, they have a long slot, a shorter slot, and then the ground plug, and this one's called the neutral. The shorter one is the hot. That's the one that's oscillating between 170 and negative 170 volts. You say, wait a minute, 170, where's that come from? Well, the RMS value is equal to 1 over rad 2 times the max value. And if you multiply 1 over rad 2 times 170, 1 over rad 2 times 170, that's where 120 comes from. So the voltage amplitude, capital V, for a US outlet is 170. V, uh, I'm sorry, capital V RMS is 120. Anyhow, a European outlet, oh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head some other outlets I've seen. I've been to a few different countries, they all have a slightly different arrangement. I think I've seen some where it looks maybe more like this, kind of a oval shape. There's two of them, just like we have in the U.S., but instead of round, they're oval, and some of them don't even have the ground plug. And instead of a slot-shaped receptacle for the plugs, they have these round holes that the pins go into. And so the devices that you plug in, oh, maybe we plug in something like this. Maybe there's a big clunky object we can plug in. And so it has these two round pins that fit into these holes. Uh, in fact, you'll see some things that plug in like this, and then on this face of it, there's the receptacle that'll receive US. In fact, if this contains a transformer, then we can take the 240 volts from this outlet and turn it into 120 volts. Um, that's the beauty of AC electricity. And that's why we're revisiting transformers now. Now that we've studied the behavior of AC electricity, we can better appreciate the transformer. After all, transformers work on Faraday's law. And Faraday's the, uh, law is the one that says induced voltages are equal to a number of windings this is magnitude here, multiplied by rate of change of flux. You hear that word change, rate of change of flux. So DC electricity doesn't present a change. DC electricity is steady and constant. 
AC electricity um, is constantly changing. The voltage is sometimes positive, sometimes negative, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. So because of that, you can transform the electricity if you have, let's see, what would be in here? It would be like a... piece of metal like this, like iron, and you wrap wire around one side of it, you wrap wire around the second side, well you don't wrap it, it already comes this way, and if the number of windings here differs from the number of windings here, we say if N1 differs from N2, then you can transform the electricity, you can send 240 volts in and get 120 volts output. So what do we want in this case? Well, we definitely want a step-down transformer. We're making the voltage go from 240 down to 120. Because these transformers work on Faraday's law, it turns out you could flip this transformer around. Here, I'll choose a different color for the wire on the secondary coil. So if I reverse this, and put the wire the other way around. Now the red wire with the smaller number of turns has an input, and the blue wire with the larger number of turns is the output. Then it would act as step up instead of step down. The voltage in would then be less than the voltage out, where in this case, if the number of windings on the primary is uh, greater than the number of windings on the secondary, then the voltage out is less than the voltage in, and it's stepped down. In either case, the voltage you get out is equal to um, the number of turns. Because there's a negative sign if we consider Lenz's law. The voltage out on the secondary, here, let's draw it for this case, voltage on the secondary is equal to, I'll ignore the negative sign, we'll just say in magnitude, is equal to the number of windings of the secondary multiplied by rate of change of flux. So when you flip it around, um, I think N1 still refers to this blue wire that has a large number of windings, so N1 is now the secondary and N2 is the primary because we've reversed it and so now we have an output that's equal to N1 color code this correctly now our output is N1 times oh goodness our output is now on coil number one so V1 is equal to N1 d phi dt. Now here's the thing about this. If we compare these two expressions or these two equations, the quantity that's the same in both these expressions is d phi dt. For a simple reason. It has to do with the magnetic domains of the iron primary coil behaves like a magnet. All solenoids tend to do that, right? When an electric current passes through a solenoid, then you have an electromagnet, and if it's mounted on some um, material with a high magnet magnetization like iron, then it can be a very strong electromagnet because the alignment of the domains. So for a moment, the magnetic field lines point upward but the current reverses and the magnetic field points downward and all the domains align and all that magnetic field then appears in the secondary coil. In other words, the strength of the magnetic field in the primary matches the strength of the magnetic field in the secondary and so um, the flux per coil, right, that we've kept the N out of the rate of change, right? And so this d phi dt is the rate of change of flux per coil, per turn.
And it's the same in both the primary and the secondary because it's the same magnetic field that's being passed between the two. So if that's the case, if I rearrange each of these equations, this one says d phi dt is equal to v2 over n2. And if I rearrange based on a diagram of operating the transformer in reverse, we say d phi dt is equal to v1 over n1, but these have to be equal. So v1 over n1 has to equal v2 over n2. So that says if we think of v1 as the input and v2 as the output, then we have an output voltage that's equal to our input voltage multiplied by the ratio of the number of windings. So we often call this the turn ratio. So if the turn ratio is less than 1, if N2 over N1 is less than 1, then that means you have fewer windings on the secondary, greater number of windings on the primary, and you have a step-down transformer. If N2 over N1 is greater than 1, then we're just saying the number of windings on the secondary is greater than the number of windings on the primary. So step down versus step up. It's all a matter of turn ratio. Oh, did we answer our question? Should the transformer be step up or step down? Well, it's definitely step down. We want to change it from 240 to 120. And what is our turn ratio? So to make it step down, the turn ratio N2 over N1 has to be less than 1. In fact, in this case, N2 over N1 would have to be exactly 1 half if I want to transform it from 240 to 120. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean the number of windings on the primary is 1 and the number of windings on the secondary 2. is. I don't think anyone would ever design a transformer that just has one winding on the primary and two windings on the secondary, or vice versa, two, I'm sorry, this would be two windings on the primary and one on the secondary. It's probably a whole lot of windings on the primary and not quite as many on the secondary, and as long as the ratio is one to two, you're fine. So this could be like 8,000 turns on the primary and 4,000 turns on the secondary, as long as the ratio is one to two. All right, moving on. Question number two. What's the RMS value of the current in the immersion heater? So let me remind you, the immersion heater is power rated at 600 watts, and it's rated for a 120-volt U.S. outlet. We found out in our last lecture that the average power in an AC circuit is the RMS value of the current amplitude multiplied by the RMS value of the voltage. So the RMS current is equal to the average power divided by RMS voltage. So if we divide 600 watts, and I'm assuming that's what this means, right? Average power, it's stated right there in the problem. 600 watts divided by 120 volts gives 5 amps. Let's turn this into a chart. primary and secondary. So we have a number of windings. We've got a RMS voltage. Got an RMS current. And we have, uh, oh, I'll add another column and either call it resistance or impedance. We'll come back to that. Either way, it's a quantity that's measured in ohms, not volts, not amps, not a number of turns. Our primary has a, uh, well, just has a value N1 and our secondary has a value N2. We don't know exactly what the number is. We know the ratio. 
we know N2 divided by N1 is equal to 1 half. Uh, voltages, okay, so the primary voltage is 240. So again, we're referring to this uh, European outlet that gets transformed into 120 volts. And on that secondary side, this is primary, this is secondary, into the secondary is our immersion heater. 120 volts for the secondary, 5 amps for the secondary, and there we have it. Question number three, what's the RMS current in the primary? So a transformer ideally doesn't heat up when it's operating. Although, usually when you feel them, they're a little bit warm. We have a large number of windings on the primary coil, a small number of windings on the secondary. So this is our step-down transformer. And there's a changing flux from the primary. Well, what's getting a changing flux? The secondary coil? or the iron core itself. The iron core actually has a changing flux, and that would generate um, eddy currents. But we always limit the eddy currents by making this iron core out of a bunch of wafers of metal that are pressed together. And if we can limit large-scale eddy currents, then only the tiniest amount of energy can be wasted as heat, enough that we can say the power out the secondary power out is well, it's probably slightly less than the power in because of the wasted thermal energy. But if we ignore it, then we can say in the idealized case, the power out is less than or equal. And if it's absolutely ideal, the power out equals the power in. And so it's the product of current and voltage in I1 times IV and the product of voltage and current out, I2 times V2, that are equal to one another. So, let's see, yeah, double check. 120 times 5 gives us a power of 600 watts. So if the power of the primary is also 600 watts, then do the math. 240 times X has to equal 120 times 5. It's pretty clear this must be 2.5 amps. So look at what we have here. What's happened to the voltage? It's been stepped down. Why is the voltage stepped down? Because the turn ratio is 1 half. But what's happened to the current? It's been stepped up. Uh, I think we can write an equation based off of the idea that power in and power out are equal. And uh, you should be convinced that the current output is equal to the current input not multiplied by the turn ratio, but multiplied by the inverse of the turn ratio. Uh, let's take a minute and derive that formula. So I1, V1 has to equal I2, V2. So I2 equals I1 times V1 over V2, but I know V2 over V1 is equal to N2 over N1, so that means V1 over V2 should equal N1 over N2, or in other words, V1 over V2 is the inverse of N2 over N1. So that's exactly where this equation comes from. Okay, now let's look at what's happening with resistance. Um, well, we can just use Ohm's law here. Voltage, current, resistance. Now, by the way, if V here represents the maximum voltage, again, this is a sinusoidal 
quantity, right? It's something that oscillates. Voltage versus time is constantly varying, and there's a peak value to that quantity. Uh, likewise, the current oscillates in time, and it has some peak value to it. So if the V represents the peak value and the current represents the peak value, then we can find resistance by dividing the voltage amplitude by the current amplitude. Then again, we could take the RMS value of both of those. And that would work as well. We could find resistance by dividing RMS voltage by RMS current. You just can't mix and match. You can't divide an RMS voltage by a current amplitude and expect to get any meaningful value for the resistance. <whistles> Lie down. Sorry, talking to my dog in the middle of this video. Okay, moving on. If that's the case, let's find resistance using Ohm's law for the secondary coil. In other words, what's the resistance of this metal part of the immersion heater? All we have to do is divide an RMS voltage by an RMS current. It should be 120 volts divided by 5 amps, and that's equal to 24 ohms. Now notice what happens if we apply Ohm's law on the primary. In other words, what's the resistance of the input side of this transformer? If we divide 240 volts by 2.5 amps, we get 96 ohms. So wait a minute. Voltage has been stepped down. Current has been stepped up. Resistance has been stepped down. And it hasn't just been stepped down by a factor of 2, it's actually been stepped down by a factor of 4. I have a suspicion that the resistance on the secondary is equal to the resistance on the primary multiplied by the turn ratio. Remember, in this case, our turn ratio N2 over N1 was equal to 1 half. I think if I take the turn ratio and square it, the equation is satisfied, and that's exactly the case. So a step-down transformer steps down the voltage by a factor equal to the turn ratio. The current gets stepped up in a step-down transformer by a value equal to the inverse of the turn ratio, and the resistance of a step-down transformer gets stepped down but not by a value equal to the turn ratio, by a value equal to the turn ratio squared. Though I think I want to change the language here and call it impedance instead of resistance. So let me remind you, in general, something about AC circuits. You really can't build any circuit without having some amount of inductance resistance, and capacitance. Now sometimes the inductance and capacitance are negligible, but they're still there in the circuit to some degree. For the most part, we want the resistance to be much, much greater than the inductive reactance and the capacitive reactance. If that's the case, then when I hook voltmeters up across all three of these circuit elements, the voltage across the inductor, the voltage across the resistor, and the voltage across the capacitor and compare. I want the lion's share of the voltage to be across the resistor so that most of the power goes to the resistor. The resistor is the quantity we refer to as the load. This is the device that you're trying to power and the uh, circuitry has these inevitable inductive and capacitive values. So let's investigate how frequency plays a role in the relative value of these voltages. And in the first case, let's imagine a really low frequency. Now the voltage across an inductor is equal to inductance multiplied by rate of change of current. Well, at very low frequencies, the current goes in the clockwise direction and maintains the clockwise direction for a while before slowly it's reversed back the other way to counterclockwise and then it stops slowing counterclockwise and comes back to clockwise. This seems like a very small value for DIDT. When the frequency of the generator is low, 
the voltage across the inductor is guaranteed to be low because it's a very small rate of change of current associated with low frequencies. So voltage across an inductor is practically zero for low frequencies. However, if the frequency is really high, if you, uh, if you have a generator that has a knob on it that controls the frequencies, uh, or you have some way of uh, making a variable frequency, then if frequency is high, the current goes this way, and then it comes back counterclockwise, then clockwise, then counterclockwise, and clockwise, and the current's reversing so quickly that you have a large rate of change of current. Now the voltage across the inductor is going to be uh, uh, very high, and it'll steal away from the voltage that remains for the resistor. After all, Kirchhoff's loop rule is always in play, and if a lot of the voltage is wasted, so to speak, across the inductor, less is available to power the load. Let's talk about the capacitor. The voltage across the capacitor depends on how much charge is on the capacitor. If we divide charge by capacitance, we get voltage. Now here's the thing about charge. It takes time to build up. So back to the low frequency situation. If the frequency is low, the current builds up and builds up and flows in a clockwise direction and keeps flowing clockwise for an extended amount of time. And in that process, there's enough time for a significant amount of charge to build up on the upper plate, and therefore it develops a large voltage before finally, after a long time, the current reverses and comes back the other way if the frequency is indeed low. And so the capacitor eventually loses its charge, but the current continues in the counterclockwise direction for a while, and that charge builds up on the negative plate. And so the charge is going to oscillate. It's also sinusoidal, but there's going to be a significant RMS value to that charge that's going to mean there's a large RMS value to the voltage. However, if the frequency is really high, I think you understand what's going to happen. Let me draw again. This is getting a little messy inductor, resistor, and capacitor. Well, at a high frequency, the current flows clockwise, but only briefly before it's reversed back the other direction. And it doesn't allow enough time for any charge to build up on the plate before the current goes back the other way and immediately discharges <clears throat> whatever it was trying to charge before a large value can build up. So the voltage across a capacitor is very nearly zero for high frequencies. So as long as the value of the resistor is a, region, a reasonably large number of ohms compared to the inductive reactances, inductive reactance for the inductor is omega times L. So this is what I'm saying, that the voltage across an inductor is almost zero if the frequency is low. For really low frequencies, you have very small inductive reactance, and um, according to Ohm's law, voltage is just reactance times current. So with very small frequency comes very small reactance, and with very low reactance comes very low voltage. So even if it's a substantial amount of Henry's of the inductance, if the frequency is low enough, you're not going to have a whole lot of uh, number of ohms across the inductor, and therefore not many of the volts of the generator are dropped across the inductor. They're there to be uh, applied across the resistor. And so likewise, the capacitive reactance is 1 over omega C. So you can see if omega is really high, then the capacitive reactance is low and the voltage is almost zero. So as long as we have some frequency that's not too high or not too low, it doesn't stray too far from the resonant frequency, then most of the voltage is across the resistor. But there's some always non-zero value for the capacitive reactance and the inductive reactance. And so there's an overall impedance to the circuit that's equal to the square root of R squared plus the difference between the inductive reactance and the capacitive reactance quantity squared. So as long as the value of R is quite a bit greater than the difference between the capacitive and inductive reactances, then there's really not a whole lot of difference between the impedance of the circuit and the resistance of the circuit.
but it's better we refer to the quantity as impedance. So the impedance for our immersion heater on the primary coil, it's an impedance of 96 ohms, and the secondary coil, the immersion heater itself, has an impedance of about 24 ohms. Oh, so I got ahead of myself. I already answered question number five. What's the impedance of the primary coil? 96 ohms. So as a matter of review, how would you answer these questions? A step-down transformer, what does it do to voltage? A step-down transformer steps down the voltage. That's how we name transformers, based on what they do to the voltage. And it steps it down by a factor known as the turn ratio. Turn ratio is N2 divided by N1. Okay, next question. What does a transformer do to the current? If it's a step-down transformer, it actually... Oops. Steps up the current. And it steps it up by a factor equal to the inverse of the turn ratio. What about impedance? A step down transformer steps down the impedance, but not by a value equal to the turn ratio by a value equal to the turn ratio squared. So now that we know more about AC electricity, hopefully you have an even better appreciation for how Faraday's law can be applied in the case of a transformer.